technology, this is a series of three web webinars that we will uh, 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 co organize between ELS and uh, BARD, uh, BARD Dickinson Company, uh, to celebrate and to commemorate uh, the 10 year launch of the 3D uh, mesh in Southeast Asia. Today, uh, the topic will be a new advance in the laparoscopic inverted repair, and we do have two excellent spe speakers. Assistant Professor Sujit Vijayatna from uh, uh, consultant at the Alexandra Hospital and National <laughs> University Hospital. May I have my slides, please? Can you share my slides? And uh, Amit Badawar from uh, USA. Thank you, Dr. Amit, for being with us. He's uh, in the east coast of uh, USA. And uh, he will be, he will just wake up at five o'clock in a very cold weather. Uh, in a very cold weather. Well, I want to remind all of you, uh, can I have my, my four slides? I want to remind all of you that uh, at the end of the trilogy, uh, we will have a contest, a video contest. We want to award uh, maybe one or two or three best video in uh, using a laparoscopic, a, a, a laparoscopic a surgical approach. And this contest <clears throat> will be awarded to the, uh, to the five best video that uh, uh, will be submitted. There will be a recognition plaque. We will be uh, giving a handbook on hernia, and uh, we will try to award as much as we can, and including a presentation during our uh, next uh, uh, ELSA conference in Hong Kong in 2021. So we, the judge panel will evaluate using uh, one of the latest uh, uh, score video that has been validated. And we hope that uh, many of you and many of your friends, you can spread out the news, will be uh, submitting video. The submission will end up in July and uh, you can submit, we will communicate uh, with you uh, the submission email or you can just email to the El ELSA secretariat. Uh, without further, delay uh, le let me pass the virtual microphone to uh, professor sujit for his presentation on uh, recent advances in in one hernia repair okay uh, thank you prof uh, can you hear me yes very well okay so good evening to everybody yeah so with uh, the topic um, under new advances uh, in laparoscopic inguinal hernia repair. So I'll be talking to you about what's beyond standard TEP repair today. I I'm sure most of us know uh, how to do a posterior repair, a standard TEP repair. So, so let's see what uh, has evolved uh, beyond the TEP repair. Yeah. Uh, my disclaimers are as written there. So the background, uh, inguinal hernia surgery and nearly all of surgery is evolving. And uh, seroma, hematoma, recurrence, osteopathy pain and uh, patient satisfaction. So these things still remain a challenge to most of us. And then uh, new surgical techniques that improve uh, these conditions are actually quite important if you are targeting at achieving a uh, high quality of care, in, specifically in uh, Surgery. Patients are becoming more complex. Uh, their comorbidities are becoming more complex. So we need to think beyond the standard repair. So for reducing seroma and recurrence, uh, we, we published this study uh, last year. Uh, it's about uh, closing or, or uh, placating the, the direct defect. So what happens uh, in this particular uh, study is basically we had uh, two institutions who participated. So uh, 150 plus patients uh, in the unrepaired site, the repair site or the plicated site, we had 219. So we saw a significantly uh, better outcome in terms of seroma and significantly low recurrence rates uh, in the group who we actually plicated these direct defects. Um, People use different words. So some people say plication, some people say uh, closure of the defect. 
but I think the more correct word is uh, is actually imbrication. So you basically get the uh, direct the the transversalis fascia on the direct defect. You basically plicate it to fill the gap in the defect. So big hernias, direct defects, uh, it's an M3. So there's a risk of meshoma, there's a risk of mesh migration. And uh, these things can be reduced and seroma can be reduced using this technique. Um, can, can I get the first video so I could uh, demonstrate how the surgical technique? OK, perfect. So this is already dissected. You can see uh, quite a big de uh, defect. Uh, so what we do, we basically uh, get the invert the the, the sac, uh, the or the pseudo sac or the remnant transversalis fascia. Then we basically plicate it uh, to the underlying fascia. So what we do is we try not to bring uh, the two edges of the defect together. What we try to do is we, we try to fill in the gaps. Because we are still uh, complying with the principles of hernia repair, so without having tension, so we just fill in the gaps to make sure that uh, the risk of seroma and the risk of recurrence is low. So we use a barb suture uh, in this particular case, uh, uh, and most of the other cases we use a barb suture. This is a, a one O suture, non-absorbable. So you can see that I, I, we are, we are, I'm not trying to close the gap here. I'm basically uh, inverting the, the, the remnant uh, transversalis fascia, uh, which is anterior layer of the transversalis fascia. And then basically, I'm just uh, imbricating it uh, to just fill in the gaps. It's very important that uh, we don't go uh, more laterally in this side, because uh, laterally, what, ha what happens is most of the the core structures go laterally, so I, I completely avoid the, the lateral uh, side suturing. I stick to the medial side and just imbricate it. Yeah, so that's about it. Uh, the other important thing is uh, in this kind of large defects, uh, what kind of mesh we use. So in, in, in this particular, so medium weight or lightweight meshes are quite good. But the issue is uh, if you use a, light, a completely lightweight mesh, there's a risk of meshoma uh, unless we close a defect like this. So the other important thing I'm doing here is basically I'm injecting a local anesthetic, uh, which I will talk to you in detail about it. So uh, I'm injecting a local anesthetic uh, into the retromuscular tissue uh, and most of my patients, these patients in our institution actually, are pain, uh, their pain score is quite, uh, zero post-op. So uh, here uh, I'm injecting local anesthetic uh, around the, the three nerves, uh, which I'll go into detail later on. So then uh, I finished the operation by using a 3D max mesh in this case. Yeah. So because it was a, a quite a big defect, uh, I actually uh, fixed this uh, mesh as well. Okay, uh, how do I go to the next one? Yeah, okay, perfect. So uh, this is the other important thing. So seroma recurrence, yes, but how about post-operative pain? This is uh, uh, basically a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials. Uh, it's about eight uh, randomized controlled trials uh, that they have analyzed. And uh, okay, let me go into the next slide. Okay, so they actually use uh, eight uh, RCTs with uh, 20 to 30 patients per arm. And in all, uh, all of the studies, they use uh, uh, BPYKIN uh, local anesthetic uh, infiltration into the preperitoneal space. They didn't uh, actually infiltrate into any of the tissue. They just put the local anesthetic in freely into the preperitoneal space. Four of the studies uh, uh, injected uh, local anesthetic into the port sites. And uh, saline was uh, uh, used as, uh, as the control. So what happened in this particular study? Uh, they found that uh, there is no real benefit of uh, 
uh, infiltrating local anesthetic or bupiracin into bupiracin space. So we, I, I mean, we read this study. Uh, we also to look at the outcomes they have measured, basically post-operative pain at uh, four to six hours and also 24 hours. Then we also looked at a uh, few of the studies that were done recently. Then we, we use a different, slightly different technique. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so this is the conclusion. There was uh, not much of a difference, no statistically significant difference between the two arms. So we use 0.2% uh, lopiacin. Why 0.2%? We tried out different uh, concentrations and we realized that 0.5 sometimes can give rise to temporary uh, weakness of the, the muscles around the <clears throat> in the legs. Then, so, but point two never gave uh, uh, all these uh, undesirable side effects. And uh, it works very well. Uh, and we injected about 5 ml around the ileal inguinal and the gentropimoral nerves. We, we didn't inject uh, very close to the nerve. We just inject uh, around the, 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 the fatty tissue uh, around these nerves. And then about 15 ml into the retromuscular tissue uh, within the transversal fascia on each side. The results were quite Fantastic. So, so far we've done about 110 patients and the pain score was, uh, was actually zero uh, and we used visual analog scale. Zero uh, within four hours uh, for stop in about 86% of patients. Uh, it was quite interesting. This is after closure of the defect as well. And uh, as you can see, the, the rest of the patients also, the pain score was quite promising and uh, the pain score was zero about four to eight hours uh, in 90% of the patients. And none of them had the uh, urinary retention. Uh, and our cohort of patients actually included patients who are 80s and even 90s, and none of them had ARU or active immunization. None of them had paralysis. Once we've been done, those are point two, and no wound infections uh, or mesh infections. So it was uh, quite interesting uh, that we had these results from this slightly different technique. So uh, moving on, uh, how do we improve patient satisfaction? So. Um, we published uh, this particular study uh, about uh, patient satisfaction as a follow-up study from an RCT that we did to compare single port and uh, multi-port uh, laparoscopic um, inguinal hernia repair. So uh, this study came out last year. So what we did was uh, we basically uh, used uh, an already uh, uh, validated uh, body image questionnaire, we slightly modified it according to our perceptions of our patients, and then uh, we use it to assess their satisfaction. Um, I, I, I may not go into too much detail because uh, later on, I, I will uh, be going through some of the videos, so it may take some time. So anyway, um, the body image questionnaire, had uh, modified body image questionnaire had few components. One is body image scope. Uh, which is basically, uh, say for an example, are you less satisfied with your body uh, since the surgery? So uh, no, not at all, uh, it, it gives you the minimum score. And then uh, four is the worst score. Yes, extremely uh, uh, unsatisfied. The cosmetic score is basically how they perceive their scar um, and how satisfied with their scar. And the rest, uh, uh, we use uh, quite similar criteria that they have, they have used in the original body image questionnaire. So results were quite quite promising as well. So uh, when we analyze a single port group as well as our conventional TEP group, uh, we were quite surprised that uh, most of the questions uh, were statistically significant, better results for the single port group. So. Uh, and, and this opened up our eyes and, uh, and, and we thought, yes, we should offer this uh, single port technique uh, to patients who, as, as a routine option, uh, if the expertise is available. So in our original uh, randomized trial uh, in our institution, we, uh, there was no significant uh, difference between the two arms uh, in terms of uh, post-operative complications, pain scores, etc. But uh, this, in these long-term results, we found out that uh, patients are very much satisfied uh, from the single port technique. So I've talked about how to reduce seroma, how to reduce recurrence, and uh, how to improve pain. And uh, let's, let's, let's go on to some of the case, uh, cases that we have performed so far. I also talked about how to improve patient satisfaction. This is an interesting case. It was a 96-year-old gentleman. 
uh, who had a large inguinous cortical hernia. And uh, yeah, so he was quite weak. He was uh, quite, um, he was uh, ambulant. And uh, the only issue he had was he could not carry this uh, huge hernia with him. So he was quite desperate to get it done. So uh, dissection uh, <clears throat> as usual. So we started uh, medially, then we are moving unilaterally. Um, so dissection uh, of the, the indirect sect. I'm also using a reusable energy device here, so uh, which makes the surgery quite faster. Yeah, it's a bipolar energy device. Yeah, so the hernia was reduced. Uh, we managed to reduce it, uh, so that's why I attempted uh, TAP in this case. Otherwise, I would have uh, attempted a TAPP or maybe even open. Yeah, so we managed to completely reduce the hernia. So then we like get the set. Maybe I'll fast forward a little bit here. So this was uh, quite a quite a big set, uh, and later you will see how how large is this defect. So if you don't do anything special in this kind of case, uh, there's a very high chance that the mesh will migrate into the the defect. So in our original study, we, we uh, that we published about uh, closing the direct defect uh, it was mainly uh, medial defects that we closed. But in, uh, we also uh, tried out the a similar technique for inguinal scrotal hernia. So you can see how big the, 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 the defect is. So this is also quite important. So we invert the, the sac, the remnant sac, but we take care uh, not to go closer to the core structures. So I, I completely avoid the medial site for this particular case. So just indicating uh, the remnant sac here. So a few few sutures to to hold it in place. Uh, I I do reduce the the the, the CO two insufflation uh, pressure to about uh, eight. Uh, because uh, otherwise it may be a bit difficult to close it completely. So you can see that we uh, managed to reduce uh, the, the large defect into about uh, two centimeters in size. Yeah, so again, uh, the infiltration of the local anesthetic. Uh, so this is under the, the rectus muscle. So then follow up with a uh, Seven, uh, uh, five by seven uh, inch uh, mesh. This is the, the extra large. Um, so this is POD one, uh, how the patient looked like. So I, I use the extra large mesh for most of these, uh, extra large 3D mesh mesh for most of these uh, uh, large defects. Uh, can I go to the next video? Uh, uh, can I go to the next video, PJ? Hello? Yeah. So this is a similar case. I will fast forward a bit more. So this was a, a hernia that was not completely reducible. So then, uh, then we I open up the sac, uh, look at the contents, and then uh, reduce it under vision. Then uh, make sure the hemostasis is adequate. Okay. I'll fast forward a bit. 
So this is uh, how, how the, the defect look like uh, in this particular case. I will remind you, yeah. So this patient had a large uh, remnant sac on, as well as a slightly smaller direct defect as well. So we use a similar technique uh, to picate the, the large uh, indirect uh, remnant sac. And I use the same suture to basically plicate the, the direct defect uh, in this particular case, and then uh, use a extra large uh, 3D max mesh. So it's very important not to suture close to the cord structures. So what, what we do is mainly like filling gaps. Uh, we just, uh, we, we try not to bring the two edges closer, but we just fill the gaps by using the remnant uh, indirect linear sac. Yeah, then followed by the local anesthetic injection. So mo actually most of these patients, uh, it's quite promising that their pain score is zero uh, post-operatively. So uh, extra large uh, 3D max mesh is uh, placed here. Okay, uh, maybe we go on to the last video. So this was an 84-year-old lady, um, a reducible large uh, femoral hernia. So this uh, uh, shows the anatomy quite clearly as well. So I described the, this, this, uh, this technique for, uh, uh, I discussed how it's done for a direct defect, so indirect defect, and now this is a femoral uh, defect. So as you can see, that's a peritoneum. So we dissect the peritoneum first. Inferior epigastrics are here. I'll fast forward a bit here. Okay, so then uh, this is a female, so need to identify the round ligament and the attachment of the peritoneal sac to the round ligament. So we usually divide the round ligament in these patients. If it's a very young patient, uh, we actually tack the round ligament into the coopers. But she's an 84 year old, uh, she's still quite ambulant, so we did not tack uh, the round ligament in this case. So this was the, the, the large uh, femoral hernia sac uh, after complete reduction of the small bowel. See, it's, it's quite big. Uh, So that's a defect, and then this is the edge of the sac, so that's done. Yeah. So in this particular case, uh, we can actually suture, or we can just use the, the tacks uh, to tack the, invert the sac, and then uh, tack it to the Cooper's ribbon. Yeah. I think this is my last video. So followed up with a extra large uh, 2D max mesh. Okay.
Thank you very much. Uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer. Uh, Prof. Lamanto, uh, over to you. Uh, we we talked during during the conference and during presentation, and also the new concept of uh, reducing the weakness. Uh, uh, that is one of the causes of recurrence by closing the defect. I think our study on direct hernia uh, was uh, very shows very significant improvement in the recurrence and seroma, and hopefully also for the lateral indirect hernia we'll see together with the with the improvement and maybe of the possibility of pain with the uh, with the block of the lateral cutaneous genital femoral nerve. Uh, we will uh, reserve the, the discussion to, uh, to later after uh, Dr. Amit uh, talk. Uh, it is quite interesting. I think we choose this topic because today the mesh evolution, mesh technology has changed a lot uh, from uh, small pore, heavyweight, lightweight, large pore, small pore, so 3D, non-3D, fabric and woven. So there is, there is a bit, not, not a bit of confusion, but there is a, an evol it's an evolution. And we see how the patient compliance is uh, much better today. And uh, uh, even though uh, I want to just uh, uh, let all, everybody know that uh, all the data that we have today that are published are data that talk about mesh technology of five, 10 years ago. So we don't know the performance of the latest mesh of the mesh that has been in the market since two, three years up because follow up is very short. So without further uh, delay, uh, I pass the visual microphone to Dr. Amit for his talk. Wonderful. Thank you, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be able to come to you from the East Coast of the United States. Um, hopefully the internet stays stable. We're in the midst of a winter storm, so uh, please let me know if um, the voice or the video is not coming through very well. Uh, again, it's a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, my objective here is to talk about some of the basic science between the different mesh choices. As consumers of these mesh products, surgeons are exposed to a variety of different types of mesh. And it's my endeavor today to try to help you classify these meshes and understand some of the science behind some of these choices that you'll be making when you select mesh. Now, with respect to hernia repair, it's a balance. You wanna to try to balance the recurrence and keep it low, but also try to maintain um, a, a, an understanding and a level of infection. Heavier weight meshes, those meshes that are uh, tend to repair the hernia and prevent recurrences, tend also to be a little bit more prone to infection. So it becomes a balancing act where you don't want to over, over balance in one direction or the other. And some of the information I'll present to you will help you decide which way do I want to go with when I select the mesh. So it's important to know that uh, all meshes are not created equal. That much is for certain. So what would be an ideal synthetic, uh, synthetic mesh if we talked to anybody? So what would you select if you had any types of characteristics for an ideal synthetic mesh? Well, obviously, you'd want it to have a pure, uh, provide a durable and a long-lasting repair, such that it re avoids recurrence. And it allows good, rapid tissue integration. It doesn't shrink very quickly or very uh, to a high degree. It can obviously resist contamination and if you don't want it to be overly expensive. But what's more important is you want it to be what I call inconspicuous. You do not want it in and of itself Promote any, promote any form of deleterious sequelae. You don't, it, you don't want it to be the cause of problems going down the, down the road. And you want to make sure that the inflammatory response listed by the mesh itself is low. Now, what type of categories, if we were to categorize mesh into several different categories, what types of categories can we do so? There's, you can categorize thing, meshes by the type of material and the type of construct. Is it a laminar type of mesh like EPTFE sheets? Is it woven or is it knitted like polyester and polypropylene meshes? Are they woven or are they knitted? Are they permanent or are they resorbable? In other words, will it ultimately go away or will it stay in the body forever? And also the filament type that's used to knit or weave these meshes. Are they monofilaments or are they multifilaments? 
And you can also make different, several different modifications. You can reduce the weight of the mesh by decreasing the size of the filament, or you can increase the porosity by making the, the knit structure more wide. Also, meshes can be categorized and stratified by where you implant them, extraperitoneally or intraperitoneally. And intraperitoneal meshes should have an adhesion barrier associated with them. So these are different ways to categorize these mesh devices. Um, my objective here now is to go in and talk about some of these different categories and how they differ from one another. So if we look at um, uh, these different categories, if we look at the different types of meshes, the EPTFE type meshes, the sheet like products on the left, the polyester meshes in the middle, and the polypropylene meshes on the right of your screen. So laminar meshes, of course, have low rate of adhesions of the EPTFE because in and of itself, EPTFE is an adhesion barrier. But EPTFE being such a good adhesion barrier does not have very good tissue growth. It has significant shrinkage. And if it becomes contaminated, uh, there's almost 0% chance of salvage of the mesh. It must be removed. The polyester meshes, well, they're multi-filamentous meshes and they're typically braided meshes rather than knitted uh, into monofilament, like monofilament meshes and polypropylene meshes. They are pliable, but related to a uh, laminar material. They are difficult to salvage, salvage due to its multifilamentous nature, and they have a high surface area because of all those little multifilaments, are each individual filaments have a high surface area associated with the mesh. Whereas a monofilament mesh, like a polypropylene mesh, is equivalently pliable to a polyester. It's far more biocompatible because of the low surface area, and they have a good chance of being salvaged if the contamination were to occur. You debride the mesh, you treat the patient, but with the low weight mono monofilament materials like polypropylene, you have a chance of salvage of the mesh. In fact, in the contemporary literature is really reinforcing that. Now, what about pore size and types of materials with respect to tissue ingrowth? So if we start to look at that, we, we I reference a paper, a seminal paper published a while ago, but it's important to talk about this because this paper really characterized the histopathologic response to different types of synthetic meshes. Uh, published by uh, Dr. Gary Nibetsky in the United States, he demonstrated that polyester type meshes, including EPTFE meshes, the laminar meshes, which I took out of this slide, but I wanted to highlight that polyester meshes have a high degree of foreign body giant cells, which indicate that the body's response to this material is, is treating it like a, a large foreign material in a foreign body. And these foreign body giant cells result in encapsulation of the mesh, which the patient then translates into the feeling of, I can still feel the mesh. And that's because you've got this massive fibrotic encapsulation elicited by these foreign body giant cells. What about if we look at polypropylene type cells, polypropylene type meshes? Well, they, if you look on the right side of the graph, the histology scores when you look at foreign body uh, giant cells, the low weight polypropylene meshes like UltraCro and Prolog have a very low foreign body reaction compared to Priatex and dual mesh, those that are more composite meshes and those that are multi-filamentous meshes. So polypropylene meshes have lower foreign body responses. The monofilaments in general had lower foreign body responses and the monofilament polypropylene devices are far more biocompatible, which would have been predicted because the multi-filament multi and uh, laminar meshes all have uh, high surface area, which means you have more interaction with the body, which means you have a higher degree of in, uh, foreign body response. So, once, uh, so this is an indication that lower weight monofilament devices are more appropriate with respect to biocompatibility. What about tissue ingrowth? Well, I mentioned that these laminar meshes like EBTFE have zero or to very minimal tissue ingrowth into the interstitium of the mesh itself. Polyesters this has that high grade inflammatory response characterized by the foreign body giant cells. But when you look at uh, the histopathology with the low weight mo monofilament device, like polypropylene, you see a low-grade foreign body response. It's very ample tissue integration into the interstitium of the mesh. So all of this is collagen that's being de de deposited into the pores of the low-weight monofilament devices. Another indication that those low-profile monofilament polypropylene devices are better. Uh, what about pore size? You can see in this comparative histopathologic slices that you can actually see and measure the pore sizes between a microporous or small pore mesh and a macroporous mesh. So both of these are monofilament polypropylene, but you can see that the tissue integration between 
the mesh fibers is ample of microporous polypropylene. But with a macroporous, you have very little mesh uh, interacting with the body in the middle of those macropores. So you do definitely get tissue integration. But I hope you can appreciate that the strength of the repair with micropolar porous polypropylene will be stronger than with macroporous because there's very little susceptibility if you try to, to, to poke through the mesh in any of these areas. It's very little, it's not very susceptible because there's a mesh fiber in your way. Whereas if you try to poke through the middle here, you may in fact be very susceptible because there's no mesh reinforcing that. And in fact, there's been very many macroporous or ultra uh, lightweight meshes that have been taken off the market because we've over challenged this and, and increase the pore size to such a high degree that you get recurrences that occur straight through the middle of the mesh. So there is a balance. You don't want it to be too close together because then you've got too much foreign material, nor do you want it to be too far apart because it's going to have a susceptible repair. So there is definitely a balance and this, high, this is a pathologic slice uh, definitely demonstrates that. What about uh, material type on infectability? You know, I talked about that surface area is important with respect to uh, foreign body reaction. I'll demonstrate to you now that surface area is also very important with respect to infectability because it provides more surface for the bacteria that's in the environment to stick to the mesh. And once bacteria sticks to a mesh, it can proliferate and then develop a biofilm and then there's no salvage of that mesh possible. It needs to come out. But the lower surface area, the lower potential for the mesh to interact with the bacteria and therefore a lower level of biofilm and more, more potential for salvage. So the lower the amount of material, the higher the potential for salvage. There's a publication, I know this is a small chart, but there's a publication here that talked about in an in vitro study, interactions of two different bacterial strains, gram positive and gram negative, in this case, E. coli for the negative, staph aureus for the positive, and different types of mesh prostheses. The left side of the graph are the low profile monofilament devices, different polypropylenes, the other portions of the graph include polyester, EPTFE, and then composite meshes, and they get worse as you increase uh, on the x-axis. So the better ones on the left are the low-profile monofilaments because they have fewer colony-forming units that are recovered from the mesh itself compared to composite meshes or multifilamentous meshes. So again, the lower the surface area, the less interaction with bacteria and the less colonization based on this in vitro analysis. There was also in vivo study, so this is a conclusion of that, excuse me. There's also an in vivo study that demonstrated that in, in animals, when you were implanted with uh, different types of surgical meshes, uh, the results came out that the, um, uh, the once again, the lower profile monofilament devices were had less bacteria recovered when, when infected with staph aureus after 10 days of implantation in the body. Uh, the conclusion, therefore, was that the multifilament meshes significantly increase bacterial persistence or spreading the affected area contrasted to monofilament meshes. Again, all, sur all coming down to the surface area. It tends to, you'll see a recurring theme that the surface area, higher surface area, means a higher foreign body response, also means a higher potential for bacterial interaction. Uh, what about uh, in the inguinal space? This, this symposium is about minimally invasive surgery. So during minimally invasive surgery, you have the option to fixate the mesh or not fixate the mesh. And can some meshes be fixated and should, should, uh, of, of some types, and should all fixation be used all the way, all the time in different types of meshes? I'm going to talk about a couple of different classifications of different mesh, mesh types that consider themselves to be quote, fixation free. The first one I'm going to talk about is uh, ProGrip. It's Covidian's product, now Medtronic. Uh, they, they, this is a device that is a polyester, so it's uh, it's higher surface area mesh that have these polylactic acid or PLA microhooks to grip like like Velcro onto the uh, surface of the, uh, the body. So it sticks to the muscle or it sticks to the fascia onto which you're implanting it. Uh, they call these uh, atraumatic, but I'm going to demonstrate to you that these are in fact traumatic. And if you've ever utilized it, and if you positioned it and then wanted to move it, trying to reposition uh, ProGrip is difficult. It does cause trauma when you pull it off. Uh, they claim that it uh, delivers tack fee fixation over the entire anatomy, which to me is not appropriate because in the inguinal space, as you all know, there are certain anatomical structures that you want to protect from fixation. Uh, program lacks the ability to direct where that fixation would be placed if you choose to fix it anywhere. Um, in fact, they, they claim this to be pain-free and uh, fixation-free. 
I present to you just a couple of quick studies that talk about the short and long-term pain results um, from, from following fixation with, with uh, program. Taken directly from the abstract of this study, what you see in their conclusion is that the self-gripping mesh compared with standard lichtenstein operation had no advantages in reducing chronic pain six months after surgery. Uh, so in fact, the fact their, their claim that uh, the program is uh, pain-free cannot be demonstrated in this study, nor the following study that I'm going to present to you here today, which they, this is more of an acute pain study, where 221 patients, they found that there was in fact more pain perceived 48 hours following program implantation. And there was no difference in long-term pain. So if anything, it's caused higher degrees of short-term pain. And the previous publication I shared with you showed that even chronic pain was increased. So I'm presenting to you today, you heard uh, earlier, Dr. Sajid present information about 3D Max. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about 3D Max in the following slides. There are two different co general classifications of 3D Max. Each has several sizes within the classification. There's the conventional 3D Max, which is a mid-weight mesh, and there's 3D Max light, which is a lighter weight mesh. Uh, both are appropriate for minimally invasive surgery, depending on the trocar size, if you chose to use a 12 millimeter trocar, both are appropriate. If you chose to use a smaller trocar, the 3D Max may struggle to go down that smaller trocar, but the 3D Max light will absolutely go down smaller. But if you're using a 12 millimeter trocar, both will go down appropriately. It is designed and optimized for the minimally invasive surgical approach. You can see the geometry of this, and in fact, it's concave as well, like a contact lens. Uh, the, there's a medial marker and marked with M with an arrow to demonstrate which side you should implant towards the medial aspect of the patient. Uh, there is a notch and a crest that corresponds to the iliac and inguinal uh, ligaments and the vessels of the iliac. And it's a rounded medial edge to help conform to the anatomy itself. And in fact, you did see videos of actual anatomic implantation, so this cartoon is less valuable. But once again, you can see how it's optimized and designed for implantation and how it fits, like I said, like a contact lens to the eye. It just sits in, in place once it's spread out, it stays, the tissues collapse after desufflation, and the mesh holds in place without the need for fixation. If you did desire to place tacks, there are areas on the mesh where tacks, tacks can be placed quite readily. Uh, without fear of interrupting the areas that are the, the anatomical structures that you choose to, to you choose and need to avoid. But what about the, the fixation free? Can it be truly used without fixation? I present to you just a few papers, but there are several published in the modern literature about uh, the effect of 3D Max but with and without fixation. I'm just going to have a couple of them. Uh, Referencing, first of all, this paper by Bell using 212 tap repairs with 3D Max, 83% of which had no fixation, and you had a single recurrence at 0.5%, so less than 0.5% recurrence rate uh, when you used fixation free 3D Max repair. And then the second paper had 500 hernias of almost 390 patients using a tap repair. Uh, four were converted to open, but none had fixation. And there were low complications with the recurrence rate about 1%, so a nominal recurrence rate, with no fear of pain associated with the fixation itself. Uh, now, what about uh, chronic pain uh, Chronic pain following uh, following implantation? With an average follow-up of 17 months, these papers here demonstrated a 0.6% incidence of chronic pain. So the recurrence rate was low, as was the incidence of chronic pain. Uh, and the, these are in nine fixation-free clinical studies over 965 patients. Now, I mentioned to you that there are two general classifications of 3D Max. There's the th conventional way 3D Max, but there's also 3D Max light. And the light is a more open pore design. The monofilament structure is slightly different, but very little. It's not really the main difference between 3D Max and 3D Max light, but the 3D Max light has a larger pore. So it is going to be lower as far as burst rate goes, but you can see, despite the fact that it is lower than conventional 3D Max, which I'll demonstrate in a couple of slides, it is still quite high, higher than it needs to be. The intradominal pressure in a normal human is approximately six pound force, whereas 3D max light is about five times higher than is necessary. So despite the fact that it is, it is lighter weight and uh, has less strength than the conventional weight 3D max, it is still plenty strong. And in fact, it, there's a study that demonstrates that when you comparison, this is a study from the United States in 2019, that when you compare 3D max light versus 3D max conventional, you can see the hernia recurrence rate is normal. 
it's 0.6% for the low and 0.7% with no statistical difference between the two. And the overall complication rate remained the same. So you can see that 3D Max Lite, despite it being uh, quote unquote weaker than the conventional way of 3D Max, it is still stronger than those other meshes that are on the marketplace, including the other fixation for mesh convenience program. It is still stronger, uh, but it is a uh, lighter weight than the, the conventional weight 3D Max. And it's important to note that uh, I mentioned about trocar sizes. So the 3D Max and 3D Max Lite will both, both go down through a 12 millimeter trocar quite well. But uh, as is becoming quite in favor, especially in the United States, robotic assisted laparoscopic surgery typically use eight millimeter trocars. The conventional weight 3D Max has a little bit of a challenge going down an eight millimeter trocar. 3D Max Lite has no problem. But what we've just introduced into the marketplace and just received uh, regulatory clearance and should be available in the Southeast Asia very soon is a MID. It's 3D Max MID. And MID actually stands for minimally invasive design, but it is a mid weight between the 3D Max Lite and the 3D Max. So you'll have a third option to select very soon. And both the Lite and the 3D MID will go down an eight millimeter trocar should you choose to use for body assistant surgery. And with that, I want to thank you all for your attention. I'll pass it back to the moderator. Thank you, Dr. Amit. It was an excellent review on, um, on the all new and update on mesh technology. Uh, we will, for all the participants, we are going to launch a small survey that will be helpful to understand better uh, your perspective. In the meantime, we have a few questions. Uh, Sujit is on. Please switch on your video. Ma, uh, let me ask a first question to uh, Dr. Amit. Dr. Amit, I think there are a few questions about mesh infection and everything. So what is the today the relation between mesh technology and infection in terms of susceptibility, which mesh are more prone, which material, which kind of uh, fabric are more prone to infection? Right. Uh, excellent question. So there's nothing inherent about the polypropylene that itself resists colonization. It's the construct of the mesh. Because it's a low-profile monofilament mesh, it can colonization. There are current publications in the ventral hernia literature that talk about uh, uh, a soft mesh, which is a hard soft mesh, which is a lower, lower weight polypropylene, more open pore, being used in contaminated ventral hernias with success. Uh, a place where nobody would touch with a 10-foot pole a uh, permanent prosthetic. Um, and that is because of the lower surface area of the lower weight monofilament devices. If you get into braided or multi-filament or laminar mesh devices, that's when you run into chance, uh, there's almost minimal to zero chance of mesh salvage. So it's all about surface area. That said, there are newer market, newer devices on the marketplace, including some absorbable materials like uh, poly 4 hydroxybutyrate, which is an absorbable monofilament under, under the brand name Phasix, which actually has some biologic activity to help reduce uh, and kill bacteria. So not only does it resist colonization, it actually actively kills bacteria. So different meshes have different uh, scientific ways of uh, preventing colonization. Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you. Let's uh, move to Dr. Sujit. There is a, one of the early question that uh, from uh, Dr. Tan from uh, Vietnam. He was, uh, yes, I think it's his own experience of a patient in which a Liechtenstein was done on the right side, and after five years he got a, a left side uh, in one head. Yeah, what will be the best? Uh, uh, option, therapeutical option in this situation? Yeah, I think uh, it depends on a few factors. One is uh, whether you, uh, whether there's expertise to do a posterior repair. And uh, if you are um, quite good in a posterior repair, so one option is to talk to the patient and do a posterior repair, which is either TEP or TEPP. And uh, of course, you're more comfortable with open repair. It's, it's completely fine to do uh, anterior repair because that's what the patient had on the other side. So, yeah. I think, yes, probably either open and posterior are both valid. This is a contralateral hernia. Probably posterior a bit superiority because you never know if you have a micro recurrence on the right because, side. Yeah. You, can still, you can still explore. Sujit, there is yeah. another question. 
about uh, uh, your uh, uh, idea of closing the defect, in either a direct or indirect, probably better direct, we have more experience, more data. It is uh, your uh, needle too big, you maybe use a small one, and uh, what are the risks of uh, uh, injury any nerve? Okay, so, so this is a very specific area. So uh, the when we are closing a direct defect, uh, we should avoid the lateral side of the lateral edge of the defect because that's where all the core structures and the nerve fibers all go go towards the, the scrotum and the thigh on the on the lateral side of the medial defect. So therefore avoid the lateral side of the defect. Don't suture the the, the lateral edge of the defect. So you just need to plicate uh, the fibrous tissue, the, the, the remnant set. So fibrous tissue doesn't have any nerve. So it's very clear. And most of, I mean, our patients don't have chronic pain. Uh, in our published study, as well as the current uh, patient cohort, there's no chronic pain. And lateral uh, or indirect hernia is very important to avoid the medial side because that's where the nerves travel. And uh, and uh, suturing the fibrous tissue together, uh, so so infer so basically it's uh, is uh, inferomedial side of the uh, of an indirect uh, uh, hernia defect. So it should not suture that. If you suture, I'm sure there will be testicular pain, testicular atrophy, chronic pain. So make sure, please do not suture around the cord structure, as well as. Uh, Avoid the inferior edge uh, of an uh, indirect hernia. That's where the nerves go uh, travel. Yeah. Uh, I think you you did a good job because you almost convinced uh, for almost half of, of of the audience in uh, using a TP or TAPP plus technique. Some they do, some they will do, and some they agree to start. I think probably for direct hernia. Uh, I'm strong convinced that it's a way to go because uh, there is no nerve. The lateral cutaneous genital femoral are in the bogus area, and the ilioinguinal is a very superficial and not so 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 deep uh, because we close only the transversality. And also in open surgery, many people do the plication of the transversalis right without pain. So uh, I don't think there is a, a risk of pain for direct closure. Uh, uh, for uh, uh, Dr. Amit, uh, what, what, what do you think there will be the future between uh, synthetic and uh, long-term absorbable mesh? That is quite, you know, interesting. Uh, uh, I'm sure uh, on the dreaming side, abs long-term absorbable is the best choice for the patient. But in reality, sometimes we may need a uh, kind of uh, permanent structure. So, what, what is on the on the, uh, the R and D point of view? What how how you see your future? That's a, a lovely question. Um, now, in the inguinal space, um, the great thing about polypropylene polyester meshes is they're very inexpensive. We have to keep that in mind. When you elevate the complexity of a mesh and get into these absorbable materials, you do elevate the price because their manufacturability becomes more challenging. Now, uh, I saw one of the answers that a lot of people, and I applaud the audience for this, when they're selecting mesh choices, they, they want to see clinical evidence about the use yeah. of that they select, which I applaud the audience for. Now, the great news is, because a material like that phasix technology that I mentioned before, that polyphenolate absorbable material, was it's only been out for several, like about seven years, six or seven years in the international marketplace. The clinical evidence is now growing. So this all comes from the ventral space for the most part. But now the clinical evidence is growing and demonstrating to us and to the audience that the long-term absorbable material like the monofilament P4HP actually has similar or better recurrence rates than do uh, per permanent prosthetics. We, sorry, we, we are, your voice is broken. We, which one is the better the current rate? Uh, the, the latest clinical data, yes. this, soon published, demonstrates that at five years, the long-term absorbable physics material actually has similar or better recurrence rates 
compared to uh, permanent materials under similar conditions. This is so, for Inguino. This yeah. is for ventral, excuse me. This is only for ventral. This we, oh, don't for have, ventral. Yeah, we don't have clinical data for absorbable materials in the inguinal space yet. It's, it will be emerging as its utility gets adopted. But what's happening in the ventral space, it proves one concept that by design, the long-term absorbable physics material implants, handles, and, and performs identically to a permanent polypropylene device. And now the long-term clinical data is demonstrating that at least when used in similar clinical scenarios regarding CDC class or ASA level, you are seeing similar, if not better, performance to a long-term, to a permanent device. So the absorbable is actually doing just as well as the permanent from long, with long-term data. So I think you asked my, my opinion question. I do think ultimately uh, all permanent materials will be replaced by polypropylene, by long-term absorbables. Now, that doesn't mean it's imminent, doesn't mean in the next five years, but I do believe long-term with the growing uh, body of evidence, permanent prosthesis may go away. Uh, I, in principle, I, I totally agree and I hope this will be the future. Uh, my, little bit we need to add some clinical data because hernia as you know is a coll collagen defect connective defect uh, we probably absorbable material that uh, stimulate the scar tissue stimulate the ingrow tissue i think will be the future and uh, of course we are very interested to see the performance of a long-term absorbable mesh also in inguinal hernia that is the majority of case sujit what is your thought about uh, uh, mesh technology. What is your prefer preference? Yeah, I think for currently uh, most of uh, our our meshes that we use are large, full, uh, medium weight, uh, and especially this is important in the context of uh, large defect. So even after we closing or approximating the the defect, we are still worried about recurrence and mesh trauma. So, so it's, it's a balance. So we don't want to put uh, too much polymer material in the patient. Then, uh, on the other hand, whether we'll get a recurrence. So, so the, I mean, currently, what, what we use is, is uh, basically a large hole, uh, medium weight. Yeah. Amit, is, uh, if you see the poll, it's quite interesting to see that the many uh, are uh, agree with your 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 data. And the data published the letter that, that uh, large pore uh, is the mesh fabric technology that reduced the body response because large pore indirectly is a lightweight. So because we, we have less implantable bo uh, by, uh, material, foreign body material. Uh, and there is also one of the latest paper published about the recurrence rate that at the beginning lightweight was uh, uh, associated with higher recurrence. It doesn't show uh, that this higher recurrence and more uh, more pain and le or less pain compared to the other mesh. That is quite interesting data. Maybe a better study, better design study will give us a, will give us a better detail. Uh, in terms of mesh infection, there was a experience of mesh infection. Uh, I think most of the mesh infection uh, come from uh, handling of the mesh, uh, handling of the mesh and uh, uh, reutilization of mesh uh, in a certain situation when you, uh, you, you have a big piece of mesh to reduce the cost, you split and you sterilize. sterilize. Uh, Sujit, what is your... Uh, what what do you suggest uh, in terms of mesh re to reduce mesh infection? Uh, I think different pe people try to do use uh, different kind of things, but I think for you and me, we, we, we try not to. Okay, number one uh, is is to avoid unnecessary contamination of the mesh, so we we don't touch the mesh even. It's basically a, we call it non-touch technique, right? So from the package, uh, we, are, we don't put it on any, uh, you know, prohexin or anything. From the pack package, uh, because package is straight up, from the package into the patient, and we, we don't even touch it. 
Amit, what, what, Amit is, Sujit has to touch a very important problem because uh, even when I come here and then when I saw I go around to do like that, I saw one of the common practice of surgery is to soak this poor sterile, beautiful sterile mesh polypropylene in a chlorexidine and povid iodine and everything. So uh, what is your thought about uh, mixing and, 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 uh, and pushing a mesh in contact with uh, other chemical that then are go inside the body together? Mm -hmm. No, my opinion on that is uh, I agree that it's probably best not to do so for two reasons. One, uh, the part of the sterile before you put it in, so there's no need to add any kind of decontaminating solutions like uh, chlorhexidine or, or even bovinamidine into it. You don't need to add that. Now, what people like to do, what surgeons like to do, is to dunk it into some sort of antiseptic or antibacterial before they put it in. Now, those are high water soluble. So once you dunk it and you insert it into the body, there, there's no persistence of the antimicrobial. It, it gets uh, dissolved very quickly and removed. Uh, here's what I'm going to say, and I hope that this doesn't come around, come around flippantly, but if it makes the surgeon feel better and makes them sleep better at night, go ahead and do it. It's really not going to hurt anything. But does it help anything? Hard to say. Because if it does, it'll help for about 10 minutes while it, well, before it dissolves and moves away. So really, it does no, no benefit except for maybe making you feel better. Yes, yeah. I think we only increase any risk and we don't roll really uh, what's going on. There is a question about type 2 and type 3 giant direct hernia. I think probably according to EHS classification. Uh, I think probably, what is your, uh, uh, Sujit? I think you maybe well, you just for uh, big, large direct hernia. Uh, yeah, uh, so, two and three, what you will do? Yeah, so I think even uh, this is in the guidelines. So uh, to, to to actually uh, not to close the defect is actually we what we do is basically the technique that we mentioned uh, that we showed in our video. So to to implicate the the remnant transfer size fascia or the pseudo sac, in other words, in, in, in so called lay terms. So Implicate the serious side to basically fill in the gaps, so that will help, and uh, the evidence supports that actually. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have uh, we are on time. Uh, our one hour is uh, well uh, spent. I think uh, we, a lot of compliment for both of you from the audience, and personally, I think I need to thank all of you for the great talk, and. Uh, Thank all the participants, uh, almost 120, to be with us. And uh, we invite all of you for the trilogy part three that will be in March. You, you will receive an email. Uh, if you, I'm sure uh, the video of this, of the part one and part two will be uploaded on uh, YouTube and Elsa channel. If you keep uh, and download the Elsa app, we will send a notification with, together with the email so you can review uh, the beautiful video that uh, Dr. Sujit showed today. Thank you very much, Sujit. Thank you very much, Dr. Amit. Uh, I don't know if you are going to back to sleep or go to work. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stay right here at work, so I'm okay, thanks. Okay, you still work from home? I do. This is a great way to start the day. I'd love, I wish I could do this every day, honestly. So, you know, being able to interact with colleagues and interact with the customers is a wonderful, wonderful way to start the day. So, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Please, all the participants, take a screenshot of the next uh, uh, trilogy, episode three. Uh, it's like a, a Star Wars. Uh, understanding laparoscopy inguinal hernia complication management through literature and video will be a nice uh, shocking video uh, about uh, trouble and uh, incidents of complication, small, big, devastating complication that may happen during uh, laparoscopic hernia repair. Thank you very much and see you on uh, 26th of March on Friday, same time, 6 o'clock on uh, BART channel.